1998, I owned a travel agency and I organized trips from seven to 10 days long across the Altiplan on the southwestern region of Bolivia. Imagine just a four by four, completely packed up tourists, and on top of the roof, all the food, all the fuel, the backpacks, and all the necessary equipment to make, make this journey. I was the tour guide, I was the cook, I was the driver. So when we were heading down this, uh, this journey, we had to cross the Uni South Flat, and we reached this point after that, that it needed to decide either to continue going for another two hours to a military station and stay there for the night, or just go to the nearest community, San Juan del Rosario. At that moment, San Juan was uh, home for about 160 families. Middle, in the middle of the desert, it was very cold, and very dry. People lived there by growing quinoa. There were quinoa farmers, most of them. And uh, it was hard because there was no electricity, no sanitation services. Um, it was um, four hours away, the nearest health post station. That night, for some reason, the tourists and I decided to stay there in that community. So when we were looking for a place, we found Teófilo. Teófilo was a hardcore quinoa grower and a llama raiser. And he offered us a room in his house to stay over that night. At that house, we were uh, staying in that house. And he was, uh, at that moment, he was 35 years old. He was, uh, you know, a good provider for his family and, and two daughters. And he was uh, offering us this place for us to stay. So that evening, the tourists were learning how to take showers using a bucket of water. It was very difficult for them for the first time ever. But on the other hand, I was also going to cook dinner, and I was preparing dinner in a, in, a, in a kitchen. It was very uncomfortable as well. It was not easy. Smoke was coming out of the firewood, very difficult to breathe, but also was not, wasn't a sink in the kitchen. It was not easy to wash dishes or prepare the food. The countertop wasn't available. There was a little table there. So it was not easy at all. During dinner and, and later of the, of the evening, I was just thinking about it, you know, what, how many opportunities we can have to actually change the situation. This is really, you know, something that we can do about it. And I was, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I was just, oh, I can do this and I can establish this. So the next morning, early in the morning, I went out and, had prepared, and began preparing breakfast for the tourists. And at the same time, I was having a long conversation with Teofilo, telling him like, hey, we can establish this project and if you're available and interested, we can actually change this and bring some income to your family. He was like, okay, I can do it, you know, let's, let's help me about it. And, and we agreed to start three projects. Build two bathrooms and two showers, the first project. The second project was to actually fix the kitchen, to install a new, a new stove and also build a sink with a faucet. And the third project was to fix the room. I had to put some concrete to the floor, also pl plaster the, wall, the, the walls and also paint it to make it more appealing to the tourist. And he said, okay, we can do this. And I, he's like, I don't have any money. So, okay, we can just work together. I can give you some, you know, agency can give you some loan and advance of payment of services, and he can, you can do it. And he accepted. So one year, and half, one year and a half later, the situation in that family changed a lot. It was very, very different. But not only in, the, in, in that family, but seven other tour operators in the same community started absolutely the same idea. So they, they, they opened the same kind of models in seven in new, new families, and they were you know, creating more income in, those, in that community. Two restaurants were open and providing dinner to the tourists. And that was in the first year and a half. Even a mechanic shop, it was open. It was a very good service for us because we, the, the road was not easy together. Three years later, the community changed 180 degrees. It was, it was impressive. Not only bigger hotels and also more investment, the, the benefits, they were bringing more resources to the community. More shops were open, people were buying, tourists were buying some goods as well as the tour agencies. There were even a museum was open about the llama and all of that in that area, desert life. And even like a handicraft um, store, an artisan shop was open. And everything was in three years. So all of that, I was like, impressed. And that just changed my professional path. I was like, I want to do this. I want to replicate this all over the world. I decided to join completely the other side, for, for, for profit to non-profit, completely the other side. So since then, I decided to replicate this idea. So during my career, I was like, I want to make this world completely different. I was just going all over the places trying to find this organization. I was working with different organizations trying to solve this problem. And I realized that, that poverty is complex to resolve. It's not easy. 
it has multiple factors, so it requires a multifaceted approach, otherwise it's not gonna be successful. But not only that, as well, continue working on this, and I realized that poverty is also a combination of mixing factors that are working and interrelating to within each other. But those two factors are divided into most, uh, almost two main, main components, the drivers and the amplifiers. So the drivers, I, I understand to look at them, but it, the poverty in a diff different situation since then, I realized that the drivers are the ones that are forcing the poverty cycle to actually spin, spin always in a circle way. If you don't change the drivers, then the poverty cycle will continue spinning around and will never be resolved. Those drivers, imagine that, are lack of access to education, lack of access to financial services and business training, and lack of access to economic development. On the other hand, you have the amplifiers. And the amplifiers are daily issues that are affecting families in poverty. Imagine if you don't have water in your house. Imagine if you don't have sanitation services. Imagine if you don't have education. How are you gonna succeed? Imagine you have a poor nutrition in your home. How your kids are gonna survive the next year? All of those are affecting and actually making poverty spin even further, making poverty even dragging it down even in a more powerful way. The interesting thing is that in 2013, I learned that uh, without a multifaceted approach, this cannot change. So in 2013, I received this phone call from a friend of mine. She is, can you help me to start this financial inclusion program in, in the organization I work with, it's called Global Brigades? And I was like, well, tell me more about it. And she explained to me during our conversation that this organization is a volunteer base, that it's focusing in improving health, sanitation, water, income generation activities in poor communities to sustainably exit poverty. And I was like, I love it. I love this idea. So since then, I joined that organization. And I'm working in different countries with amazing staff completely dedicated to sustainable exit communities out of poverty. But they have a specific model because that's what I like the most, the model. They call the holistic model. I wanna tell you a little bit more about this model. This is a five-step model that is sequentially happening. You have to go step by step and every step attacks in a specific facet of poverty. At the end of the fifth step, Something happens, a community ends and it's power out of poverty to continue the development path. But it requires an active participation of three basic elements. Community participation, local staff that is committed to the, to the exercise, and volunteer support. And I want you to remember that because I'm coming back to that topic later in the conversation. Since then, We've been applying every single step, and I want to tell you a little bit more about every single step. The first one we go to, it's, it's about health. The first thing it, it, the model addresses is the health issues in the community, nothing else. First address the health issue. Try to solve that before anything happens. To that, we bring doctors that provide medical care, affordable medication to the patients, patient referral system to hire more complicated treatments, as, as well as um, health workshops that are provided to community members, and also a community health worker. It's also trained to make sure that they provide basic preventive care to the community members that are in the community. Once that is happening, then we can go into the next step. But before that, we work with the community members because they need to understand that development requires their contribution, their involvement. Without that, ownership in the projects and solutions that we're applying in the community are not gonna be sustainable. They're gonna just last nothing. They need their contribution. So they need to understand they need to contribute from themselves to make these projects possible. So the first thing we do with them is the community bank. It's community-owned bank. So it's kind of like having a little community bank in, in this little village of like 150 families. So they put an amount, an investing amount, in, in, in uh, they decided commonly, and then we match it with the resources of the organization and make that as a capital C. At the same time, we're, we're working with the community members too, and some community members are the board directors of the community bank, 
to give them enough tools and build their skills to manage the bank successfully. And we give local training every single week to them. At the same time, this community becomes, with financial training to all the community members, this, this bank becomes what we know as a source for loans and savings. And they learn to use financial, financial support to reach new goals, to buy a new livestock, to buy a new machinery, to increase inventory in the store, or actually to save for the next project that is coming to the community, which is step number three. They need to fix the water system. We need to implement something to change the need to solve the situation of the lack of water. So we build with them and their contribution as well. They contribute to the, to, the, to the project. So we build with them a water system that connects water directly piped to the homes. And then we also train a local water committee to ma make sure that they have enough, enough resources and tools and knowledge to maintain this water system operating all the time. When that's ready and the, and the families are having this water all over available, then we go into the fourth step, which is hygiene and sanitation services. In the fourth step, we built, with the support of volunteers and community members, sanitation units that provide specifically access to a clean toilet, shower to bath, a sink to wash hands, and a water storage to, to conserve water. When that is going on, we also built with the families eco-stoves that reduces the consumption of, of wood and also reduces the effect of a smoke in the house, which is another issue of, of illnesses. So we are attacking already so many drivers and amplifiers of poverty cycle, and we're ready for the next step, step number five, which is economic development. At the beginning of this step, we work with, with specifically with community members to look for the future in a different way. They are ready to start something difficult because they have been implementing so many other solutions already. So they're, they're going to be going through uh, learning about business development and writing business plans to increase the production or increase the yield of a, of a farm. They're going to be learning about accessing loans so they can project their, their income and, and be, access these opportunities of reaching new markets. At the same time, community members are going through this important understanding of financial services, what the benefits of these services is for their lives. And suddenly, they trust the system so well that they're increasing their savings every year. And that's creating a situation where we can say the community is going under economic growth. And that is when another driver of the poverty cycle is broken. Now, this model, it's not a, just an idea. It's actually a reality. Since 2016, the organization Global Brigades is undergoing an initiative called the Empower 100, which is empowering 100 communities that represents about 65,000 people out of poverty. Not only that, but it's also going to con contribute to create a blueprint for ending poverty in these communities and potentially expand the model to other countries. Let me show you a little bit about what are the results of just last year, 2018? There were more than 112,000 patients treated just last year. More than 91 community health workers started working in the communities. More than 21 community banks were established just last year. More than 796 savings accounts were opened last year. More than 3,000 hours of health workshops were performed. More than 568 families have now sanitation improvements in their homes. That's just 2018. We're committed to hit our goal. We're committed to empower 100 communities. But this model has three elements that I mentioned to you before, which are community participation, trained staff, and volunteer support. And volunteers are responding to this call by thousands. And they're coming from different backgrounds, health, legal, engineering, biotechnology, education, even high school students are responding to the call. Because they understand that poverty is everybody's responsibility. Not just an organization, not just a few people, not just a nonprofit. It's everybody's responsibility. 
and you and you and you and you as well and you sir all of us all of you are part of the solution you too all of us are part of the solution we are the ones who can make a decision and you are the ones who can make a decision either to join global brigades and go in a brigade do something or find another organization that you feel committed to because they're doing a great job in fighting poverty. And now that you know these elements of drivers and amplifiers, you can actually ask for them. Are you driving, are you, you know, addressing these issues? And you choose this organization to work with and, and donate if you need, but do something to work against poverty in this world. Because of all the speakers that you've seen that you're gonna be hearing today, they're gonna to be talking about multiple issues that affect poverty. You are gonna be listening to this and, and the effects of poverty is incredible. I want to share with you a story of an old lady, a wise old lady. Her name is Eladia. And she's an Embera woman in Panama. She's indigenous. And she told me when I was presenting the information the first time to her, she's like, Paolo, why are you here? We're poor. What do you mean save? We don't have any money to save. Just give me money. Money is what I want. Just give me money and leave. Problem solved. And I was like, no, Eladia, we're going to work together on this. Just give me an hour and a half every week. And we started to work with her every week. In every week, we learn a little bit with her, and she learned a little bit with us. Two years after, Eladia was able to save $2,000 for her grandchildren's education. That story is along hundreds of other ones that I can tell you about. It. But the most important one is what you want to do, what you want to do in regards to poverty, to be the next one here presenting a story that is worth spreading out. Thank you.